Hi. Hi. Oh, that was great. Really glad to have you here today. My name is Ken, and uh, I get to do a lot of teaching around here up on this big honking stage, and uh, I love doing it, and I'm really, really glad that you're here this morning. Hey, um, uh, it's an exciting time of year, isn't it? I mean, today's exciting for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is it's the last Sunday before school starts, right? Isn't that cool? So I know parents are going, yoo-hoo, yippee. Somebody sent me this picture uh, off their Facebook page. I know school doesn't start till next week. Just walk slowly, you know. <laughs> Some of you are thinking, I should have thought of that. Um, but today I'm excited because obviously it's like we're getting back into the groove and next week we're every, everything is happening. We're back into Super Sunday next week as we kind of launch our fall ministries. The other reason I'm excited is because of baptisms because today we have a chance to watch some people pledge their allegiance to Jesus by being baptized, by declaring that they're followers of his. And that's an exciting time in their lives, an exciting time in our life as a church to watch people make that kind of declaration. So whether you're watching online, you're down at our Kitchener campus, you're in our Waterloo campus, I want to tell you, this is a really, really exciting day. And I want to ask you a question, okay? Have you ever been so excited about something that you couldn't keep it to yourself? Have you ever been so excited about something that you just couldn't keep it to yourself? Maybe you got that car you'd been longing to have, right? You finally got the car, you got it, there it is, you're driving it around, you're driving around showing the neighbors, showing your friends, showing your enemies, hey, look at this cool car I got. You're just so excited about it, right? Or maybe you went to watch a movie, and it was that, you know, that movie that really engaged you. You were right on the edge of your seat the whole time, and you come out of that movie, and you went, whoa, that was a great movie, and you, I'm going to go back and see it again, you know? And maybe you tell some other people about it as well. Or maybe it's a restaurant that you've been to, and the food was so good, and the service so amazing, and the price so cheap that you're going back again, right? And you're going to tell your friends about it. If they pay, for sure, you're going to take them there, right? Or maybe it's a vacation place, and you went, and it was a great place, and everything worked out really, really well. It's cool. I'm sure that if I asked the question, have you ever been so excited about something that you couldn't keep it to yourself? The answer would be yes, for sure. That's the truth in our lives. So I remember when I was a kid growing up in Toronto that we lived near the Humber River. And the Humber River was a place that we used to play. Now, in the summertime, at the stretch of the Humber River that we lived near, it was more like the Humber Creek because it just dried up. There was this little meandering stream of water with puddles all around it down at the bottom of the riverbed. And we used to play down there catching frogs and doing big adventures and making big discoveries. We called it the Humber. We didn't call it the Humber River because we were cool as kids. It's just the Humber. And I remember one time being down at the Humber with some of my buddies, and we discovered something in one of those pools that was by the stream that used to be the river. And I remember looking at it, and we saw this cre creature in the water, and we were like, what is that? This is amazing. It was about a foot long or so, and it had four legs, and it was underneath the water. It had these red, fluffy things out the side of its head, and a big mouth and these beady eyes. And we were looking at it, and we were thinking, we've discovered the missing link. It's amazing what we've discovered. And we were just thinking, what are we going to do with this thing? So I said, I'll run home and bring back a pail, and we'll capture it, and we'll be famous. So I ran home, it was about a kilometer home, I went into the basement and got a pail, ran all the way back. My buddy stood around that pond with sticks, guarding it, afraid of this little guy. What was he gonna do to them? They didn't know, this is a monster. And so they guarded him, I got back with the pail, carefully laid the pail in the water and they gently prodded this little guy and he moved around and finally he darted inside the pail. And I tipped the pail up full of water and there he was inside and we looked, our eyes were big as saucers, what have we got here? This is incredible. We're going to home and show everybody. So we began to carry this pail full of water and this creature inside. And um, every once in a while, we'd stop because we were tired. We'd look inside. Eyes would get big. We'd step back. We were a little afraid of it. And we got to the street. We lived on a dead-end street in Toronto, which just meant that, you know, we could be on the streets all the time. And it was just a very friendly street. And all the kids, there was like... Baby boomers were everywhere, okay? I'm a baby boomer. It was one of those streets. We had lots of kids on the street. So we went around with this bucket trying to show everybody what we'd discover. And some girls would scream, ah, and run away. That made us excited. And some people would just kind of look inside. But finally, we found Sarah. She was tall. She was older. She was smart. She was pretty. She was in grade seven. So maybe she would know what this was about. <laughs> So we asked Sarah what was going on in here, and, and we showed her the bucket. We thought maybe she'd scream and run away. That'd be cool. She looked inside, nonchalantly, kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, that's a mud puppy. There's lots of them in the Humber. And she walked away. <laughs> and all of our excitement just kind of 
went, flew away. You ever seen a mud puppy? That's what they look like. Yeah, kind of crazy, eh? Anyway, all that to ask the question again. Have you ever been so excited about something that you couldn't keep it to yourself? Now, the people who are being baptized today are so excited about what they have in Jesus that they can't keep it to themselves. And so they're being baptized this morning, um, and they're declaring their allegiance to Jesus and what it is that's happened to them and how they're followers of his. And to be excited about what Jesus has done for us is really, really important. And when you fully understand what it is that he's done in our lives, if you've believed in him, it should really pump you up, fire you up, get you excited. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in one of my very favorite chapters in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, writes about it this way. He says this in verse 17. And I'm using the New Living Translation here. He says, it reads, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. When you think about being a new person and what it is that Jesus does, he gives us a new perspective, new set of values, new goals in our lives. We discover that the guilt is gone, that forgiveness is ours, that there's a new kind of peace in there. We have another place that's different from the way the world thinks about what makes us significant. It's what God thinks of us. About what gives life meaning, it's God that gives life meaning. About where we discover security, our security is found in God. When you start to think about all of those things, you're a brand new kind of person. You think differently, act differently, value things differently. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The old way of thinking is gone. The old values are gone. A whole new, wonderful, special kind of life has just begun. And then Paul says, and all of this is a gift from God. This is what even makes it more amazing, is that everything we're experiencing is God's gift to us, and we need to learn to unwrap the gift and embrace the gift that God has given to us of significance and meaning and security and so on and so on. All of this is a gift from God. We didn't earn it. We can't pat ourselves on the back. It's an amazing gift that only God could give who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given this, us this task of reconciling people to him. In other words, God is saying, I want you to be so excited about what it is that you have that you're going to tell other people, that you're going to share it with them. So I remember when I was like in my late teens, early 20s, there was a song that was pretty popular. It was called, Get All Excited, Go Tell Everybody That Jesus Christ is King. Any of you ever remember that song? Get all excited, go tell everybody. I won't sing the rest of it. <laughs> That's the first line. Get all excited, go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King. Second line. Get all excited, go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is king. Third line, get all excited, go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is king. The lyrics weren't that hard, okay? Jesus Christ is still the king of kings. So that song was out there, you know? And it's interesting what's happening in this text is that Paul is saying God has given us this task of reconciling people to him, of telling people, getting all excited about what we have. For God was in Christ, here's that word again, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of, what's the word, can you say it with me? Reconciliation. Now, what's reconciliation? Well, if you've got two people who are distant from each other, where there's disharmony, distrust, hurt, reconciling is bringing them back into a face-to-face, -face, together relationship. And this is the message that we have, a message to tell the world that God in Jesus is seeking to reconcile the world back to him, for us to embrace and follow and get close to him. You know what it's like to be irreconciled into a relationship that's not reconciled or needs reconciliation, and the experience you can have when that happens. So Carol and I, we dated on and off for like seven years. Lots of times off. Lots of time on, okay, on and off for seven years. And she'd sit on the side of the road picking daisies. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And I had no idea either, right? But eventually we decided that reconciliation was going to happen, that disharmony, we were going to become one. We got married, we had five kids, seven grandchildren, and a dog later. That's what reconciliation looks like, okay? So it's that wonderful experience of coming close together. And, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation, of helping people get back right with God. So, we are Christ's ambassadors. That's another way of stating this. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead. Come back to God. Like, come on back to God. That's what we're pleading. That's what we're proclaiming. For God, I love this verse, for God made Christ who never sinned 
to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Can you read this sentence off the screen with me, please? You ready? For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. It's just an amazing thing. And here's the question. Have you ever been so excited about something that you couldn't keep it to yourself? Have you ever been so excited about something that you couldn't keep it to yourself? Well, sometimes, when you're really excited about something, you don't share it. And I think we could put a lot of the reasons for us not sharing what we're excited about into a basket called fear. And because of fear, we, there may be other reasons, but certainly because of the fear of two things. Fear of rejection, okay? And another fear I'm going to call confidence. A lack of confidence causes us fear. So the fear of rejection is if I tell somebody that I'm really excited about this, they might reject me. They might push back. They won't respond the way I want them to, and, and, and that's not a fun thing. When I'm excited about somebody and somebody, something and somebody pushes back and rejects it, it's like cold water. That's not a good thing to be buzzed by, right? So, for example, I am, as you know, or if you don't know, you're going to know, and you will know, a big, big Raptors fan, okay? I am addicted to the NBA. It's something, it's God's sport. Um, I believe Jesus would be wearing the shirt, everything like that, okay? It's a great sport. So, guess what happened? You guys know what happened, right? The Raptors won the championship, and I am still kind of fired up about it. I'm kind of excited about it. But I know that for some of you, if I told you, if I told you the Raptors won... I would be rejected from some of you because some of you have other teams that you're voting for and cheering for. And for me to come along and say, ha, 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 the Raptors won. What do you think about that? I know that I would get hissing and foaming at the mouth and other such things. And so I don't go there. I don't go there because of the rejection that I might experience. Instead, I walk by with a really big grin on my face and wink. Okay, that's what I do. But I don't want to lose that kind of that excitement. You know what I'm saying? Another thing that can happen is sometimes people will just go blah about, shrug their shoulders over it. So I tell my grandchildren, hey, the Raptors won the championship. They'll go, that's nice, Grandpa. Can you read me another story? Okay, so that's kind of how it would unpack itself. So rejection, and obviously rejection about sharing about Jesus can be a real big thing for us. We don't want that pushback. We don't want the labels people might put on us. We understand how that can be difficult because it's a very, very personal thing. There's another reason, a second fear that we have. I called it, not just rejection, I called the second one a lack of confidence. I don't know how to tell people. I'm not sure I'd get it right. What if I send them to the wrong place, okay, after sharing this news with them? And so there's this kind of fear that maybe I'm not going to get it together. So what I want to do today for a few minutes is share a tool that you can use to, sh to share this with your friends, okay? Okay. And here is the tool. It's a very simple visual. If you've got your seat, the bulletin today, the update, you'll see there's an insert with it on the back. But I'm going to do it a little bit differently than that one. I'm going to personalize it a little more. You can personalize it and make it different. But the essence, the bones are still kind of there. Here is a way of sharing the gospel. So if one of your friends comes up to you, um, maybe they're going through a difficult time. They're telling you they're struggling. One of the things you could say to them is, I've got... I, I, well, let me show you what you could do. I put this actually on the screens here. So one thing you could do is say, I haven't been through the exact situation you're facing, but I often find that God helps me through such times. That's one thing that you could say to them. But if you have more time to engage in sharing what you're excited about, in sharing Jesus with them, you might say, I haven't been through the exact situation you're facing, but I've had similar experiences. Can I share something with you that has really helped me? Can I share something with you that's really helped me? And it may be that you're in a restaurant, you can pull out a napkin. It may be that you're in a backyard barbecue, you can pull out a piece of paper. It may be that you're at the office, you can throw it out on the desk. It may be that you can just reach over and grab their hand and draw it on their hand, depending on your relationship. That's something you might want to do. But let me just share with you this um, simple way of understanding this incredible message that we have. It's called, it's, it's got three circles. So here's the first circle. And the word we're going to put in there is the word brokenness. The world is broken. And everybody knows that. There's a brokenness that we see with people shooting other people. There's a brokenness that we see with suicides and addictions 
with isolation, with people with, filled with guilt, with war, with disease. There's a brokenness that's very, very much there. And some people have this overwhelming sense of shame, this overwhelming sense of guilt, this feeling of isolation that may be a part of their world. And there is that sense of brokenness that's there. This brokenness that's in the world is not something that God longs for us to experience. We know from what the Bible teaches us that God's perfect design, that God has a perfect design for everything. We can see it in the creation around us. We can see it in the beauty of it, that, there's, there's, that God has this perfect design for the way that we should live and the way that we should exist. And as God looks at, his broken, at our broken world, you need to know that that's not something that he wants us to experience. And what happens is, what we understand from the Bible is, the reason that we have gone into this brokenness is because of this thing called sin. Sin is any rebellion against God's perfect design of how to live. God's perfect way of life. And a lot of people don't want God to rule over them. They don't want to obey God's perfect design. And so they experience this brokenness in their world. But God wants to reach out and meet that brokenness and fix that brokenness. And what the Bible tells us that it is that in order to do that, he sent Jesus. Okay? So Jesus came down to earth. He's God and became God in the flesh. And he lived among us. And then the Bible tells us, history tells us, that Jesus died on a cross. That he took our brokenness on himself, our sin on himself. That he was buried. But then he rose from the dead to declare that in fact he had the power over brokenness. That he could heal it. That he could make it all right. Now when you look at us, we do a lot of things to try and compensate for our brokenness. And all you have to do is watch what we do, we have counseling centers, we have self-help books, we have all kinds of afternoon television programs to help us, we've got podcasts, we've got people who will um, get involved in all kinds of things to try and compensate for this brokenness they're feeling inside, from sexual stuff to drugs to alcohol to whatever it might be, and the brokenness keep, keeps, keeps being very real in our world. In fact, sometimes we make it even worse because of what we do there. And what we need to do is give up on this and turn to Jesus. And there are two words that the Bible uses to describe what we need to do. Turn away from putting our trust and our hope in all of this and believe, believe in Jesus. We need to believe in Jesus. Turn away and believe in him. Turn away from all of this, these attempts to seal our broken, to understand or address our brokenness. Recognize that we are broken inside and believe that Jesus is the one who can heal us, the only one that can heal us. And when we do that, we become this new person. When we realize who he is and put our faith and trust and hope in him. And then what happens to us is that we move back into this posture of God's perfect design. And what takes place is as we walk with him and grow and, 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 and live with him and learn about him and serve him, we start to grow more and more into this perfect design, which is more and more like Jesus. That's what happens to us. Now, once you become like that, what we've already been looking at in the verses is that you get really excited about what's happened to you, and you go and you share with the broken world around you that Jesus is the one who can be the great healer, that he's the one who can come along and meet those needs, that he's the one who died because he so loves you and makes you right with God. And the thing that you, you need to understand is that people are in one of two places. Either they're here with God or they're here in brokenness. And the question is, where are you? Because what God wants to do is he wants to move us from brokenness into, and toward his perfect design. And ultimately, we'll experience that when Jesus comes back again. This is the beautiful, beautiful message that we have. The message that we need to share with other people. The thing that's happened to you and to me. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is what you've experienced. And you're over here on this becoming more and more like Jesus right now. The brokenness is not a part of who you are. You're a new person in Christ Jesus. And I hope that that's very real and very, very true of you. You know what? It may be that when you're talking to your friend, when you're sharing this with them, 
um, that, they, that you can then stop and say, do you know where you are? Which circle would you be in? And maybe you might want to say to them, do you want to become a believer in Jesus? Do you want to turn away and put your faith and hope in this circle instead of this circle? And they might respond to you by saying, no, I don't want to. I don't believe that stuff. I don't want to be a part of that. And that's okay. That's what they have the right and the freedom to choose to do. Or maybe that they're going to say to you, you know what, I, I don't know that I completely understand it all. And you can say to them, well, let's talk a little bit more. Or maybe that they're going to say to you, you know what, I do want to believe. And, and I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want, to, I want to trust in him. And you can say to them, well, really, what you need to do then, there's no button to push, there's no magic prayer or anything like that. What you need to do is right now is just turn away from trusting here and put your faith and trust in Jesus. One way of expressing what you've done is to pray to him. And here is a typical prayer that you could say, God, I know I'm a sinner and I'm broken. I believe that you forgive me through what Jesus has done for me. I'm asking you to come into my life and help me recover and pursue your design for my life. Now, the people who are being baptized today are people who are over here. The baptism doesn't make them over here. The baptism is a pledge of allegiance to what they've already done by believing in Jesus Christ. That's what we deeply believe. That's the message. That's the exciting news. That God so loves you and sees you as broken that he sent Jesus to take care of the brokenness and bring you into a right relationship with God. And you may be here this morning and you've never made a decision to put your trust in Christ. You never turned from that brokenness and believed in him. Today would be a great day for you to do that. This moment would be a great moment for you to do that. You may be saying, ah, just not so sure. We're here to help you take next steps. In fact, I'm going to ask right now if you just bow your heads with me um, and let me just pray with you and talk to you for, for a minute. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for this opportunity we have, this exciting opportunity we have to watch these people express their faith, pledge their allegiance to Jesus, mark themselves as a follower, however you want to define it, through this thing called baptism. And I pray, Lord, that you would bless them. I pray that, Lord, you'd be empower them and strengthen them. If there are people here this morning who have never put their faith in Jesus, this would be a great time for them to do it. And you know what? Maybe you're here, heads are bowed. Maybe you're here and you've never done this. You've never put your faith in Christ. You've never turned and believed in him. This would be a great day, a great time for you to do that. If you'd want to do that, you can simply pray that prayer that I had on the screen, that prayer. You could simply do that as a way of expressing your faith and your belief. And if that's something you want to do or something you've just done, you just raise your hand and then put it right back down again. We can acknowledge that and just pray for you. If this is something you've just done or you'd like to do. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, and I pray your blessing would be on all of us. May you be honored and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.